Hello, GS subscribers. I welcome you again for this video from Professor Walter Reed. I believe there are a lot of things which you can learn, and then at the end is when I will add my comments. Welcome this video. Pope to Lutherans, let us set doctrine aside. Let's help those in need. We've looked at that before. And so they came together, the Catholics and the Lutherans, and he urged them in Sweden, let's bury this hatchet, let's set aside the doctrine, and we've looked at many of these doctrines. Doctrine is not important. Unity is important. We need to have a common voice. And the Pope likes to have the argument that if a terrorist is going to shoot you, he's not going to ask whether you are a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a, or a whatever. He's just going to ask, are you a Christian? And that's why we're all unified. Well, I'm not so sure. Let's ask the Bible what it thinks about doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Or Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them? Or what about Titus 2.1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine? Or 1 Timothy 4.13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So who should I listen to? Who should I obey now? The Pope who says, set aside doctrine? Or to the Bible that says, take heed of the doctrine? I can't, I can't obey both. I have to choose one. 1 John 1, 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. What do we do? One or the other? It's a serious issue. But for instance, in Sweden, urges Catholic Lutheran reconciliation. 500 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door, setting off more than a century of religious warfare, he says, let's get together. Atonement and Christian reconciliation. And then the Catholics and the Lutherans sign a joint declaration accepting the common path. Well, this is fascinating. The BBC also had something to say, because there are Protestants in England as well, the Church of England and the Anglican Church and all their pomp and ceremony as well. A statement from the Archbishop of Canterbury and York has said that the split caused lasting damage to the unity of the church, something that contradicted the teaching of Jesus and left a legacy of mistrust and competition. And I look back on that as history the mind just boggles. When you look at the Oxford movement, which was led by that great man, Newman, with his booming voice and his demanding presence, and everything that was Protestant was removed out of the churches, and everything that was Catholic was brought back, the altars were brought back, the statues were brought back, the images were brought back, the pictures were brought back, the mass was brought back, and the Protestant church moved into this Catholic era. And when the job had been done, he stepped over and he became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, left the Protestants and went to where he felt most comfortable. And for the work that he had done, he was canonized, and Pope Benedict, went there just before his retirement 
And he and the Archbishop of Canterbury knelt down and prayed at these sites. And they dug up the body of Cardinal Newman to get hold of his hands and the bones of his, of his hands to send them to the various churches to be venerated. And I just think to myself, oh, Protestantism, what are you doing? And this is what he said, legacy of mistrust and competition. I went on to say such repentance needs to be linked to action aimed at reaching out to other churches and strengthening relationships with them. And today's statement is a call to all Christians of whatever denomination to repent of division and to unite with the Christian gospel. So this is a, this is a worldwide movement. It doesn't affect only the Lutherans or the one denomination or the other. This is a massive movement. Unity, call on Reformation anniversary. And again, it is the 50th anniversary of a summit when Pope Paul and Archbishop Michael Ramsey, uh, which established the center in Rome, in a joint declaration issued after the service in October, the two leaders said they were under undeterred from seeking unity between the two denominations. There is this drive. And if you're not part of this drive, well, then you are marginalized. You must be an antagonist. You must be full of hate. It's got nothing to do with hate. Maybe not to agree has more to do with love than it has to do with hate. Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote to approve the Declaration of Unity with the Roman Catholics in August 22, 2016, in this massive celebration. And the newspapers of the world just bring this news to the world. Christian news, Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America voted overwhelmingly last week to approve a declaration of unity with the Roman Catholic Church in an endeavor to enumerate the many points of agreement between Lutherans and Catholics. Now, we've looked at some of those in the previous lecture, but here's a whole list of more agreements. And so I thought, well, we better look at those as well to see what all these agreements are about and to a move that some state is contrary to biblical Christianity. Well, the Declaration on the Way, that's the name of the document. Last time we looked from conflict to communion. Now we're looking at a new document, which is called Declaration on the Way, was approved by a vote of 931 to 9 during the assembly. That is scary. Nine stood up and said, no, nine. That's very scary. The Declaration seeks to make more visible the unity we share by gathering together agreements reached on issues of church, Eucharist, and ministry. The document outlines, however, it is called on the way because the dialogue has not yet resolved all the church dividing differences on these topics. <laughs> it's amazing. And Bishop Elizabeth Eaton had this to comment on the signing of this joint declaration on the way. Dear sisters and brothers, let us pause to honor this historic moment, Eaton said. Though we have not yet arrived, we have claimed that we are in fact on the way to unity after 500 years of division and 50 years of dialogue, all those jubilees there again, this action must be understood in the context of other significant agreements we have reached, most notably the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification in 1999. And that is why I thought it important that I spend a whole lecture on this Joint Declaration, which was the first lecture in the series. I also wonder what happened to dear brothers and sisters, but we're moving with the times. I'm in big trouble now. Now, here's one who says, there's something wrong here. I don't know whether he's one of the nine. He could be. 
Mike Chendron, a former Roman Catholic who now leads Proclaiming the Gospel Ministry, an organization dedicated to evangelizing Catholics, said that uh, this council was in error in seeking to find common ground with Roman Catholicism, despite these doctrinal, doctrinal disparities. He says, by seeking unity with the Catholic religion, they are departing from the biblical faith of the reformers. He told Christian News Network, they need to know that there can never be biblical unity between Roman Catholics and denominations which uphold the gospel of God. He noted several other integral and fundamental differences between evangelicals and Roman Catholics. Number one, he says, the Bible teaches justification by faith. Catholicism condemns with anathema those who believe justification is by faith alone. And then he says, the Bible teaches we are born again by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. And Catholicism teaches regeneration is by the water of baptism. The Bible teaches we are purified of sin by the blood of Jesus. Catholicism teaches purification by the fires of purgatory. He continued, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, and Catholicism offers many mediators, including Mary and its priests. And Gendron said that the unity simply for the sake of unity is contrary to the scriptures. So I'm not alone in what I'm saying, and I'm sure many of you have similar sentiments. But it's nice to know that there are a few that say, this is not the way to go. And when you claim, as I have done also in the previous lectures, that the Council of Trent made these decisions and therefore the Council of Trent is nominative and stands to this day, then many of the evangelicals that I talk to and say, ah, that was almost 500 years ago. Everything has changed since then. I mean, the Council of Trent, who cares what they said? It's important what we're saying now. Well, does Rome see it like that? Let's ask them. This is Bishop Schneider. And he was uh, being questioned about the fact that the Pope recently on an airplane said to reporters that he was perfectly happy that Martin, that the Pope actually said to the reporters that he was perfectly happy with Martin Luther's position on justification. And uh, they asked Bishop Schneider at the Catholic conference, is this really so? And his answer was, I'll read it to you, we have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent. The teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther, I repeat, are infallible, ex cathedra, and the comments of the Pope on the plane are not ex cathedra. And in case someone thinks he really didn't say that, and it's just written here for interest's sake, let's listen to him say it. Now, he has a, has a heavy German accent, so that should be quite enjoyable to you. Your, ex Your Excellency, thank you for being here today. My question is, since the discussion is about heresy, one heretic who comes to mind is Martin Luther, whose 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, the Pope will be commemorating... Um, very very shortly. Uh, on an airplane interview, the Pope recently said that Martin Luther quote, did not err on the issue of justification. Uh, what is your response to the Lutheran heresy and uh, on the issue of justification and the upcoming ecumenical events and how do traditional Catholics respond to uh, the reports that are coming out? They have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther. The Council of Trent. <laughs> the teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther and the people are infallible ex cathedra. And the comments of the Pope in the plain are not ex cathedra. There you have it out of the horse's mouth. So the teachings of the Council of Trent are ex cathedra, infallible, the comments of the Pope. Doesn't matter what he says. 
It's interesting that they could say something like that, but if you understand Jesuit thinking, and the Pope is a Jesuit, then if they tell an untruth, let me put it mildly, and it furthers the aims of the church, then that is acceptable. But he won't do it from his bishop's seat, because then it is ex cathedra. I stand with Luther. Martin Luther said, this one and firm rock which we call the doctrine of justification is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine which comprehends the understanding of all godliness. And Lutherans follow him in this, and so do I. Now they say that I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, am probably a legalist because I say we should keep the law and that we do not accept the doctrine of justification. So let me quote from one of our most authoritative sources as to what we actually believe. Here's a book called Faith and Works. It's an Adventist document. It says, let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to effect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. Here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If any man can merit salvation by anything he may do, then he is in the same position as the Catholic to do penance for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt that it may be earned as wages. So my dear Protestant brethren, I do not believe in salvation by works. I believe in salvation by faith. And the works are a consequence of that faith, not a means to that faith. And that's exactly what Martin Luther and all the reformers believed. In other words, I stand upon the pillars of Protestantism. Justification is by faith alone. And you will remember in this verse that Martin Luther, when he studied it, was overwhelmed by what he had discovered. In this excerpt from Luther and the Reformation, Sproul describes the moment of awakening Martin Luther had as he read Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther was crawling up that La Santa Scala, that holy stairway that miraculously had been transported by angels overnight from Jerusalem and plonked down in Rome. And if you crawl up it, you get indulgences and absolutions. And while he was halfway up, this verse thundered in his mind, the just shall live by faith. And then this article continues, and this uh, author writes, now there was a linguistic trick that was going on here too, and it was this, that the Latin word for justification that was used at this time in church history was, and it's the word from which we get the English word justification, the Latin word is justificare. And it came from the Roman judicial system, and the term justificare is made up of the word justice, which is, or justus, which is justice or righteousness, and the verb, the infinite facare, which means to make. And so the Latin fathers understood the doctrine of justification is what happens when God, through the sacraments of the church and elsewhere, make righteous people righteous. But Luther was looking now at the Greek word, which was in the New Testament, not the Latin word. The word is dikaios, dikaiosune, which didn't mean to make righteous, but rather to regard as righteous. 
to count as righteous, to declare as righteous. And this was the moment of awakening for Luther. He said, you mean here Paul is not talking about the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God gives freely by his grace to people who don't have righteousness of their own? And so Luther said, whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine? It's what he called justitia alienum, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. It's a righteousness that is extra nos, outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. And Luther said, when I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost and the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. And these are the things that we should remember in the time that we are going towards. Because these will fortify us. Now, this is the Journal America. This is the Jesuit Journal in the United States. And the Jesuits, of course, are overwhelmed that the Protestants are streaming towards Rome. And so they claim... Uh, that this is giving them great joy. And they quote what Bishop Eaton said when she made that quote that we are joining together, though we have not yet arrived. Uh, we have claimed that we are, in fact, on the way to unity. And Bishop Madden told America, that's the, not the nation, but the magazine, the Jesuit magazine, that he encountered Lutherans expressing a real longing for unity, for coming together during the meeting, and that while hurdles remain, ratifying the document is an indication how much we are, along, are all longing for the day when we can receive the Eucharist together. John Rogers was prepared to die rather than to acknowledge that. By taking the Eucharist, what am I saying? that Christ is being sacrificed anew for me. Then I don't grab hold of that great sacrifice that was done for me at Calvary, which set me free and anyone else that grabs it by faith. I cannot partake of the Mass. I was Catholic. The Mass was your life because that is what gave you life. But to me, that life has become death because I found a greater life, one that is real and is embodied in the Son of God. He says, this document, the Declaration on the Way, was unveiled last year, and it compiles findings from 50 years of interfaith dialogue between two churches. In 32 statements of agreement on one's contentious theological issues. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, because, again, that would take forever, and I'm already known for being incredibly long-winded. Not that you've noticed. <laughs> Preface. Here's the document. This is what it looks like. And I find it interesting that they use this, this picture, because this is Jesus on the way to Emmaus with two disciples. But it is used here in the context of Protestantism and Catholicism coming together. It just doesn't taste right. Nevertheless, the document in the preface is the Declaration on the Word, Church, Ministry, and Eucharist, is a declaration of the consensus achieved by Lutherans and Catholics on the topic of the Church, Ministry, and Eucharist as a result of ecumenical dialogue between the two since 1965. Introduction. I think, then, that the one goal of all who are really and truly serving the Lord ought to be to bring back to union the churches which have at different times and in diverse manners divided from one another. Quoting St. Basil the Great. And the question they ask there in the document, why now? Because in 2017, we will commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation movement that began in deep division and now calls us to continued work of reconciliation for the sake of the gospel and our witness and work in the world. So whenever I have the little picture of the document over there, I'm quoting directly from the document. 
agreement on the church. Thus, Lutherans and Catholics recognize in both their ecclesial communities the attribute of apostolicity. Interesting. Grounded in their ongoing continuity in apostolic faith, teaching, and practices. Hmm. Apostolicity. I thought this is something that uh, Luther denied. Because apostolicity claims that the power comes from the apostolic succession from Peter down the line to the present day Peter who happens to be the Pope. So they agree on the attribute of apostolicity. What else do they agree on? Preservation of the church in union with the saints. Catholics and Lutherans agree that the church on earth is indefectible. Did you get that? Because it is and will be preserved by the Holy Spirit and in all its aspects essential for salvation, they share the certainty of Christian hope that the church established by Christ and led by His Spirit will always remain in the truth, fulfilling its mission to humanity for the sake of the gospel. Hmm. Let's have a look at that word. This is merriamwebster.com, the dictionary. Definition of indefectible, not subject to failure or decay, free of fault, flawless. That's infallible. Acts 20 verse 30, also of our own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Or 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. My Bible warns me that there will be defectibility, and I must beware of it. Okay, uh, by God's grace, I believe you have been blessed by this video. And so I, I come to give a little bit of comments on the video because I believe it has blessed you. And the video of today was concerning the, uh, the unity for instruction. They are uniting and putting the word of Scripture. But I, I do think that many Protestants and Evangelicals, they don't know what the Catholics are planning uh, as if uh, the Catholic is just putting uh, the, the lobe of the sheep while inside their walls. And so we need to understand that we don't need to judge all Protestants and all evangelicals that they are uniting for evil, but some have been deceived. And as time goes on, those who will know the truth, they will learn away they will get out of Babylon. And so we believe there are many, even leaders, who truly, uh, truly seek God, but they might be deceived because of the system. But as God is working, uh, preachers and priests, Catholic priests, are knowing the truth. And they will come at the end. Some will not come soon. And so I want to say this. The Catholic is uniting people and those churches for discussion. What they are doing is what Nimrod did, uniting the people to build the name. And so the Catholic is working hard to make sure that they build the name again. The name for what? The name against God. To make sure that they, f uh, they make God like is going to lose against them to unite the world against the commandment of God, to unite the world against Jesus Christ. They are fighting against Jesus Christ. The Catholic knows, really, what they are doing. And not all Catholics, I don't mean all Catholics, but those who are top, they work together with the devil. And so because they are given the plans from the devil himself, Satan himself, giving them uh, what plans to do, through societies, through agencies, and all the plans, and where they want to go. So believe this, that they know what they're doing. But others, they have been pulled like gods, and they don't know what, they go, what, they, what is going to happen. 
they think of the unity. But, uh, uh, but what I could ask you, those protesters, is to ask what this unity is going to take us for. What is the end? We become one. What is the end? What is the goal of becoming one? It's just the matter of being in agreement on that. So they need to ask themselves. But we can't do anything to convince Protestants to do this because they have gone too far. And they're going to establish the Sunday law themselves. But what can we do individually? We have to focus on creating our relationship with God. And if in, you are in a Protestant church worshiping there, and or you are in a Catholic worshiping there, be careful. They are going to slay you. And at the, at the end of the time, when Jesus Christ comes, if you are evil, Jesus will not uh, excuse you because you are in the Catholic or you are in the Protestant or Evangelical group. It will judge you because of what you have been doing. Though they deceived you, but you did what you deserved to be beaten. And so you're going to receive. And so to avoid that, follow the Bible, my friend. You just have to follow the Bible. For the word of God. You don't have to listen to, to listen to these people who want to force you to follow the ideologies and the doctrines of the devil. But we need to focus on Jesus. Jesus Christ died for us. We are saved freely. To accept the grace of Jesus, what do we lose? The issue is to just to lift up the church. But God did not, has never called us to lift up the church, but to lift up Christ. And when the church starts to go above Christ, that is devil. Because the only person who ever wished you to go above Christ was Satan. And so when the church lifts up itself to go against Christ, what do you understand? The church becomes the agent of the devil. Because the devil is going to fight God using people, using the church. And so we need to be keen on this and to, to open our eyes that we can see. Being blind to Christ said, if you say you are blind, then you are not blind. I came to open your eyes. But if you say I see and he, Jesus, sees that you are blind, then your sin remains. And what does this tell us? If you know the truth, choose to follow the truth. Don't try to force Jesus to trust or to say you are right while you know you are wrong. So may God bless you as you have been blessed by this video. Remember to share, to subscribe. It was from Amazing Discoveries, appeared to the Protestant brethren, Darkness Before Dawn by Walter Vaith. That is it. So I believe you have been blessed.